Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to our webinar tonight, um, Parenting in a Pandemic. Uh, this is brought to you by the Institute for Family Studies. Um, I'm a contributing author there, and I encourage you to go visit the website, ifstudies.com. Um, and uh, tonight we have, uh, I'm also a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where I write about child welfare and parenting, among other issues. Um, and tonight we are very lucky to be joined by uh, Dr. Justin Colson, who's coming to us from Australia today, uh, where he works. Um, he is also a contributor to the Institute for Family Studies uh, website too. Um, and uh, I wanna just tell you a little bit, uh, Justin, before we get started. Um, he says, uh, struggling with his own family relationships, Justin returned to full-time study in his late 20s, where he earned first-class honors and a PhD in psychology so that he could learn to be a better husband and father. I think maybe a lot of people should try this. Um, and now uh, the focus of his life and his family is helping other fam families uh, try to flourish as well. He's the author of six books and is a four-time best-selling author. He is an occasional columnist for the New York Times and appears regularly in all all of Australia's major news outlets for television, radio, and print. Um, and so Justin is going to give us a presentation for about 20 minutes or so. Um, I might uh, ask him a few questions after that. And then for the last part of our session, we're going to open it up to uh, audience members. Uh, they can uh, write in with their questions uh, in the chat box. And I will be monitoring that toward the end to look at your questions and, and ask Justin to, uh, to help us along. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Colson. Here he is. Fabulous. Well, thanks so much. It's good to be with you, everybody. Uh, thank you for giving up some of your evening to talk about how we can parent better in a pandemic uh, and adapt to what is becoming a very uncomfortable uh, new normal for family life. There's a couple of things that we're going to focus on here. I'm going to go through it fairly quickly because 20 minutes is tight and I want to be able to give you as much useful information as I can. So one of the first things that we'll discuss is just how we can manage our own anxiety. Uh, there's still so many messages that I'm receiving. I have a Facebook following of some 130,000 people or thereabouts, and I'm still receiving consistent messages from people all around the world who are essentially saying, uh, this is hard, I'm not coping, I'm struggling. Uh, how long is this gonna go for? How am I supposed to deal with the children? Uh, why is homeschooling not working for me? Everybody else's social media seems to be so calm and balanced and it's not happening. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about how we can manage our own anxiety, particularly when we uh, couple those um, th those family issues with the issues surrounding economic concerns and worries. You know, we're we're worried about losing jobs. Many people already have lost their work. Uh, income is a challenge. Different countries have different safety nets and different ways of doing things here. But it, there's certainly concern among so many people as we confront what is turning our world upside down. Once we've spent just a few minutes talking about how we can manage our anxiety, I'm going to shift the focus to our children. So we can't work particularly effectively with our children if we're not at least a little bit level and balanced ourselves. Don't know if you've noticed this or not, but emotions are contagious. So if you're a little bit crazy, if you're a little bit cranky, if you're a little bit um, chaotic, your children will catch that chaos or that crankiness or that craziness. But if you're calm, they will catch your calm as well. Not always, it's not a perfect correlation, but there'll be a nice balance between the two. So we're gonna talk about how we can understand our children in a level way, particularly as they start to escalate, You know, especially if you're dealing with a child who's stressed out about school or who is missing their friends. One of my daughters just the other day, we went and had a socially distant, appropriate and safe uh, door knock with some friends. So we tapped on the door. We moved well back, you know, had, had the conversation from four meters away, but it was a Sunday night and we just wanted to drop off some Easter goodies to them. And so we did that and we sang some songs together, uh, you know, several meters apart. As we left, my 12 year old said to me, dad, I just miss talking to people, you know, like, having real conversations instead of over the screens. So we're going to talk about how we can navigate this with our children from toddlers through to teenagers and specifically look at creating a way forward to help you to just deal with some of the practical issues over the next few weeks or months as life continues to throw all of these curveballs at us. So let's talk about this critical thing right now. And that's just that our families need leadership and they need it now. Our, our children are looking to us as adults to essentially guide them through something that they can't comprehend 
And when they see us being calm, when they see us being capable and in control, even if we're not, if we can give them the illusion of that. See, our children thrive, especially young children, but even into their teens, our children thrive on predictability and security. They feel safe. They feel capable of exploring. They feel like the world is a manageable place when the people who are leading them have a level of, I'm not going to say overt and explicit confidence, but rather a, a level of assurance. This is the way we're going to be okay. Just follow me. Even if we're losing jobs, even if there's no money in the bank, even if this, this, and this, if we can provide them with that stable, calm security and assurance that things will be okay. Somehow we're going to work it out. Our children will respond extraordinarily well. We've had an airline in Australia just go into administration. And one of the pilots who obviously lost his job because flights are grounded, he hasn't been able to work, picked up some work as a full-time employee at a local supermarket stacking shelves. He was interviewed in our media and essentially his response was, I can't do what I love, but I can provide for my family. And right now it's a privilege for me to have this job. It doesn't matter to me what the job is. It's a privilege to be able to have this job and to be able to su support my family in whatever way is necessary. And there was just this wonderful humility and this tremendous assurance that he was doing everything that he could. And I, I couldn't help but think that his kids are probably looking at dad and hearing that, uh, hearing that confidence, that leadership, I'm going to look after you. We can get through this. We'll make it work. I might not be flying planes and doing the glamorous job anymore, but we're doing what matters. And that's what they're looking for right now from us. So how do we get there? How do we manage our own anxiety? How do we deal with the uh, rising tide of fear and concern and worry when we are watching jobs go or watching uh, medication become less available or we're seeing all the toilet paper disappear from the shelves, uh, whatever, whatever it is that's causing your blood pressure to rise and your fears to surface. The first thing I would say is this, anxiety is normal, it's healthy, it's natural, you're supposed to feel it. If you're not feeling anxiety, you're body and brain are not working the way they're designed to. Anxiety means that we have a, a level of fear or apprehension about something that's coming in the future that's either big and scary or that's uncertain or both. And so we're supposed to be anxious about those kinds of things. The, the problem with anxiety becomes when that anxiety becomes too big to manage, when it starts to interfere with our capacity to be functional in other domains of life, like in our relationships or in our work or in our day-to-day -day living. So we need to be able to manage it to a point where we're acknowledging that, yeah, right now I am a little anxious. Right now this is a concerning time, but there are things that I can do and I need to stay in control at some level. Okay, so that's what we're really trying to do. And I'm just gonna share two ideas. I, I wish I could talk to you about this for hours, but in the time that we've got, I'm just gonna share two ideas that I think are tremendously helpful and tremendously useful. One of them is not particularly novel. You've probably heard this a million times, but I'm gonna say it anyway. You've gotta turn off the news. We can really, truly, honestly get by without being glued to the news constantly. And I'll tell you why. A few years ago, uh, before he passed away, in fact, when I say a few years ago, it was actually a few decades ago now. It's, it's gone very fast. Stephen Covey wrote a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And in that book, he talks about operating within either our circle of concern or our circle of influence. Circle of concern is all the stuff we're worried about. It's the stuff that makes the headlines. Thing is, you can't do anything about what's on the headlines. Literally, unless you are running the country, and I'm guessing that if you're on this webcast, you're probably not running the country. Unless you're running the country or running the state, you can't really affect what's happening in the headlines. So these are things that we're concerned about, but we can't do anything about. And those are the things that actually make our anxiety go up the highest. Why? Because we actually don't have any control at all. Whereas when we focus on what's in our circle of influence, that is we focus on the things that I can control, the things that I can do something about, the things that I can have some impact on, all of a sudden we start to feel effective. We start to feel what psychologists call agentic, like we're able to make stuff happen. And that helps us to feel competent and confident and capable. It builds our relationships. It gives us a sense of control and autonomy and volition. It meets our basic psychological needs in a profound way. So again, to manage our anxiety well, if it's important for you to be across the news, and for many of us, it actually is important. Can I suggest 
a five to 10 minute scan of headlines. Don't get bogged down in the detail. A five to 10 minute scan of headlines in the morning and maybe later in the afternoon, certainly not before you go to bed, but later in the afternoon and, and get away from the news. Tone down your Twitter usage, switch off your Facebook because all of this stuff takes you away from what you can influence and just either it's pure escapism or it's anxiety producing content. Uh, if you go to use screens, I recommend you remember the three C's. Is this creating? Is this consuming? Or is this connecting? And you want to spend a lot more time connecting and creating than you do consuming. That's kind of my rule of thumb. Okay, so that's the first thing to help us to manage our anxiety. Uh, there's a whole lot of psychological interventions and physiological interventions. So going for an exercise, nature is fuel for the soul. Uh, connecting with people, frequent touch points, so important. But the second thing that I want to talk about is psychological distancing. This is my favorite strategy when things are getting too much and anxiety is going up. Psychological distancing, this is that thing where, let's say uh, you're struggling with something, you're not quite sure how to deal with it, and so you go to somebody who's not in the situation and you say, hey, I'm really struggling with this thing. What do you think? How do you see it from where you are? Because your perspective is different from mine because I'm stuck right in the, in the core of it. Whereas you're over here watching from a distance. What are you seeing that I'm missing? How, how could I navigate this more effectively? Now, that's how we do psychological distancing. That's, that's what that kind of is. You, you will note that you're much better at fixing other people's problems than you are your own. But, and this is where it gets kind of tricky. Right now, we're all under threat. Right now, everybody's a little bit worried. We're, we're experiencing different levels of threat depending on which state we're in and whether we're living in an apartment or whether we've got a home with a nice big lawn and some, some nature reserves down the street from us. We're, we're all experiencing it differently, but we're all under threat. We're all experiencing these regulations and watching a pandemic sweep across our, our, our countries and our globe. And, and so how do we create psychological distance when we can't ring someone and say, what would you do in this situation? Because they're in it as well and they're trying to grapple with it. I'm just going to share three really simple ideas that can help here. The first is that we ask ourselves what somebody else would do. Somebody that we respect, somebody that we admire, somebody that we look up to because they are always so wise, they're so balanced, they're so capable. What would they do? And if we can channel them. So, so for me, there's a, there's a gentleman uh, that used to be at the University of Arkansas. He became a mentor of mine. His name's Professor H. Wallace Goddard. And I got to know him really well over the last couple of decades. And so I, when I'm stuck, I just think, well, what, what would Wally do? And there's probably, you've, you've got a Wally in your life. Channel your inner Wally, whoever that is. If you can step into that persona, that, that character, it seems to create that psychological distance. It's not me doing it now. It's me thinking about what Wally would do. And I'm going to act that way. So that's the first one. The second uh, suggestion that I like to make is imagine that you've got somebody watching you. There's an audience, somebody's in the living room observing you because we tend to act very differently in public than how we do in private. We don't scream and shout at the children in the shopping center the way some parents might lose their patience and yell at their children in the living room. So by imagining that there's somebody with you, it just creates that psychological distance. It sort of slows you down and has you think a little differently about what you're about to encounter. And the third idea, oh, by the way, I, I, the, the first idea about channeling your inner Wally, I, I forgot to mention, but there's some tremendous research uh, that came out probably three or four years ago, looking at this idea with children. This works with children too, and I wanted to emphasize that. If your children are getting really caught up and emotional about something, think about who their favorite superhero is. The researchers in this particular case said, what would Batman do? And what they found is that when children considered what Batman would do, they were far more responsive, far more capable of uh, dealing with highly stressful, anxiety-inducing situations than children who were just trying to solve the problem on their own. And the third idea, well, I, I'm, I'm going to throw two in really quickly because I can't help myself. The third idea is that we t speak to ourselves in the third person. So I don't know if you've ever found yourself saying, come on, Justin or whatever your name might be. Come on, uh, Justin, what, 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 would, what would be the best thing to do here? Justin, you've got this. Justin, you know how to deal with that. This, this speaking to ourselves in the third person, again, seems to just create a little bit of psychological distance. And uh, the last idea that I like is what we call temporal distancing. And that's where we say, well, you know, in six months time, we're gonna look back on this and we're gonna be so glad for the time we got to be together because life has resumed normality again. Or in six months' time, we're going to look back at this and say, that made us change the way 
we did things in profoundly important ways and we do things so much better because of coronavirus. You know, we, we do things either at a global level or at a national level, or maybe just within our, the microcosm of our family or our church or our sports or, you know, whatever community groups you're a part of that temporal distancing as we right now, imagine where we will be in six months or a year or three years looking back and talking about what happened right now. How do we want to look back and see what's gone on? Again, that creates that psychological distance and those approaches will help you to bring your anxiety down. Okay, so let's talk about our children because this is where things get really tricky, right? I, I'm under control. I'm good, but my kids are losing it. My kids just want to talk to somebody face to face. They want to be able to do X, Y, or Z. There's a couple of things that I want to recommend here. The first is that depending on the regulations that you're dealing with within your state or you know the area in, in, in where you're being governed, I would encourage you to help your children to have the most lenient rules possible while still being completely respectful of this obviously highly contagious disease that's ravaging the globe and causing all of these challenges. So where I am in Australia right now, we're allowed to uh, be with one other person, not of our household, so long as we're in an outdoor area and we're exercising. And so my teenagers are loving this because I've, I've been explicitly clear about this. Neither of them have, uh, I've, I've got six daughters, by the way. Uh, none of my girls have boyfriends. Uh, I'm pleased to say right now, so we're breathing easy. But my, 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 my three teenage daughters, they love being able to catch up with their friends one-on-one. -on -one. There are some quiet streets near where we are. And so when they catch up, they stay, uh, I'm trying to convert to feet, but they stay two meters apart. What's that? That's like eight to 10 feet apart. And they go for a walk or a jog or a bike ride. And they get to have that face to face. They're, they're getting to spend time with their friends in a, a manner that is completely consistent with the regulations that the government has handed down. But it feels so good because they're outside and they're connecting and they're, they, they feel like they've got a little bit of a life happening. It's those kinds of things. If you can do that, That'll, that'll make so much of a difference. Be creative around what those regulations are and help them. Now, in spite of that, the children are still going to have meltdowns. They're still going to have tantrums. They're still going to struggle with what's going on. They don't like being told no. And so in those situations, what's the best way forward? Well, based on what I think is the very best psychological research, I've constructed a setup that I call the three E's of effective discipline. If, if you haven't seen it yet, and, and please forgive me for sounding like I expect that you might have, about a year and a half ago, I had a video go viral on Facebook and about 75 million people have seen it. So 75 million is a pretty big number. That's why I say if you haven't seen it yet. If you were to just Google my name and type in the words Goalcast, Goalcast is the Facebook page that shared my video. This video that's been seen at least 75 million times around the world, I describe a situation where I'm in a conflict with one of my teenage girls and I go through these three E's of effective discipline. What I do is I explore, I explain, and I empower. Explore means I try to get what's going on for you. I'm trying to put myself in your shoes. I'm trying to see the world from your perspective. Explore means I'm not just listening to the words coming out of your mouth. I'm hearing the feelings that are in your heart. In fact, I've got a little map to help us as our children stare out the window aimlessly and think life has been canceled, it's not fair. A little map to help us to do this. When we explore, we first of all have soft eyes. Now I defy you to find any research paper anywhere in the psychological world that talks about soft eyes. Nevertheless, the reason that I've got that there is because when I finished a parenting presentation here in Australia, one came up to me afterwards. She said, I'm here professionally but I'm a grandma and I loved everything that you had to say about that exploring, but I want to share an idea with you. And she talked about this soft eyes. She said, my grandmother told me when I became a mum that whenever my children were being challenging, I should always have soft eyes because when our eyes are soft, we can't be harsh or punitive or cruel to our children. Soft eyes create a soft heart. And I thought, isn't that a powerful way to help us to explore our children's inner world? Having soft eyes, it orients us towards helping and it orients us away from hurting. 
So soft eyes is how we explore. Then we focus on connecting before we correct. See, quite often as parents, we dive in and say, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's the matter? Would you just calm down and tell me what's going on? Hey, come on. I haven't got time for this. What, what, what's happening? Let me fix this for you. We're too fast to fix. But when we slow down and focus on our connection first, our children feel safe and secure. They can see that we're in control. They catch our calm rather than our cranky or our chaos or our crazy, which is what I was mentioning before. Then we focus on their perspective. So what I like to do is I, I like to talk about uh, Mark Brackett from the uh, Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. He says, if you can name it, you can tame it. Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers, uh, in, in the Tom Hanks movie, uh, Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, which we were able to see just before all the regulations came in. He says, if it's mentionable, it's manageable. What we're trying to do is sort of say to our child, you seem to be really struggling. You seem really upset. You feel like this is terribly unfair. We're literally naming the emotion that they're feeling. We're not trying to fix it. We're not trying to tell them they're right or wrong for feeling it. We're simply naming it. If we put this into an adult perspective, you've had a rough day. You try to unload on your partner or spouse. They look at you and they say, oh, gosh, would you just calm down? Get over it. It's not that big a deal. Do you ever look at them and say, you're right, I'm overreacting. I should be calmer than this. Of course not. What you do in that instant is you say, don't tell me to calm down. And, and, and it gets kind of challenging. But what if that person, what if that loved one looked at you as you were unloading and said, oh, it looks like you've just had such a tough day. It sounds like it's been a real struggle. By stepping in, getting what I call curious, not furious, and focusing on our children's perspective, what we do is we open up the communication pathways. We want to engage with the emotion, not the behavior. Don't walk in and say, what is going on? Why, why are you hitting your sister for? Well, don't throw those things. Look at the mess you've made. That's all behavior stuff. Instead, step into the emotion. We'll get to the behavior later. Right now, Haim Ginnott, who wrote that wonderful book, Between Parent and Child, Haim Ginnott said, um, statements of understanding. Sorry, sorry, let me rephrase. Statements of, oh, no, I'm going to butcher it right now. It's just gone. Essentially, he said that we should offer statements of understanding before we, we offer any statements around correction and direction. I can't remember exactly what he said now, which is quite frustrating since I share that quote all the time. But we're engaging with the emotion because once the, when emotions are high, intelligence is really low, right? High emotions, rigid thinking, narrow, focused, rah, kind of stuff. When emotions are high, intelligence tends to be low. But when we focus on the emotion, what we do is we automatically bring it down by saying, you're really struggling. This is so hard. Don't you wish it was different? You must be so frustrated. And the emotion comes down. And as the emotion comes down, intelligence returns because we've engaged with the emotion. And then as they regulate their emotion, then we can step in and try and fix things. That's the process that we want to follow because that's when we can get to explain. And explain basically says, let's just understand. You're feeling like that, but this is what I need from you. And that's about it. I won't worry about that third idea because time's getting away. But we explore, then we explain. And the last thing we do is we empower. So after we, after we get to that point, we basically say, I get what's going on for you. You're really struggling, but you get what I want, right? Like we need to treat each other nicely. Uh-huh, okay. And then empower us basically this. What do we do from here? Where do you want to go? What's the best way to fix this? And you'll find that this will usually work quite well. Okay, so, and I love this last quote, we don't do heart surgery with sledgehammers. That's from Wally Goddard, my mentor. All right, so how do we create a way forward? Given that um, our time is well and truly up, I'm going to go over this in about two to three minutes and then wrap it up by talking about just two or three quick things. First, I want to talk about homeschooling. Can I please reassure you, take the pressure off. If your children are in uh, elementary school, there should be almost no pressure at all. Even if they're in middle school, there should be minimal pressure. I'd say one to two hours of work per day. Focus on reading. Focus a little bit on their mathematics. If the teachers have sent some work home, let them do it. But remember, the teachers are sending worksheets home. They don't do worksheets at school. School is a totally different experience. And even if you're a school teacher, you're not supposed to be the school teacher for your own children in the house while you're trying to get work done and all of these other things are going on. It's just not going to work. So take the pressure right off one, maybe two hours of 
school per day for children in those uh, first sort of six to eight years of school. If they're in high school, there needs to be a little bit more focus on schoolwork, but the school will typically be taking care of that. And high school is much more easy to deal with as a general rule. They know that they're accountable to the school teacher. The school's taking care of it. You basically need to just usher them into their room and get them to do their work or stick them on a table on the back deck or on the front deck so that you can see what they're doing if having them out of their room on their device is important to you. So once again, when it comes to schooling, I just want to emphasize, lower your expectations, half an hour to an hour of reading and writing, that kind of stuff every day, absolutely critical. But beyond that, just stop trying to do it all. You can't. To let you know that it will be okay, let me point you to some research that came out of Christchurch in New Zealand a few years ago following a major earthquake. Schools were closed for at least three months, in some cases even a little longer than that. And the researchers discovered that within a couple of years, the children who missed out on that three to four months of schooling had not only caught up, but in many cases they had surpassed their peers in other cities who had been able to continue going to school. Taking a couple of months off just now, in the lead up to your summer holidays is not going to end your children's academic potential or future. They'll be okay. The research is there to support it. What they need now from you more than anything is connection and closeness and understanding. That's gonna make a bigger difference than anything. Second thing I wanna to talk to is just this idea of routines. Um, you know, a lot of parents, they've got the routine out, they've got the timetable and from 8.30 until 8.55, we're doing this. And then from 8.56 until 9.03, we're gonna have a break and we're gonna look after X, Y, and Z. But from 9.04 until uh, whatever, you know, it's all structured and it's this and it's that. Can I recommend that that is a guaranteed way to build anxiety and raise expectations and feel like a failure? If we want to be comfortable, and get the stuff done that matters. My recommendation is this, two things. First of all, on a Sunday, well, a Sunday works for my family anyway, you might have a different day, but on a Sunday, my family sits down and we talk about three things. We say, what went well this week, what didn't, and what's one thing based on what didn't go well that we can improve on this week? Any more than one, and it just gets too much, we forget. But just one thing, it's amazing what we can do. Okay, that's the first part. And then the second thing that we do, is we say, all right, what are our main priorities this coming week? And our main priorities will usually center around in our family, an hour of schoolwork every day, an hour of physical activity every day, and an hour of doing a project around the house every day. That might be weeding, it could be uh, looking after the lawns or washing the cars or whatever it is that we've decided to do as a family, we're all gonna dive in and we're gonna do that for an hour. On top of that, some of our children have music practice that they want to do or some other activities that are important to them. And so we let them put that in there, but we don't really timetable it. We focus on priorities and throughout the day, my wife and I will check in and say, Hey kids, how are you going with your priorities today? Can I help you with any of them? And that's about as far as we go. The children behave autonomously. They know what their priorities are. And it's extraordinary as we step back on the control, as we lower the expectations and just have a few priorities, how quickly and how effectively and how well they take care of them. Okay, the last idea is this, technology. Can I again suggest that loosening up on technology is probably not gonna be the worst thing in the world right now. In fact, you probably already have, and you might be feeling some guilt around it. Uh, my recommendation is don't feel guilty. Uh, what matters most with technology is whether we're consuming, creating, or connecting. Uh, we want to get the balance right. I look at technology a lot like people look at diet. We don't say to somebody, how much food time have you had today? We, that's a silly question. What we do is we say, how much junk food have you eaten? And how much healthy food have you eaten? What have your food choices been today? Much better question. It's the same with technology. What have your technology choices been today? Now, I know that last uh, week, uh, for those of you who are uh, you know following along with IFS, uh, Jean Twenge uh, did some really great work with you around screens and, and I'm not going to undermine what she said because I think that she's probably one of the best in the world in this area. Obviously, as screen time goes up too much, it does have counterproductive impacts on health and well-being. Uh, but I would also say that at this point, so long as we're looking after our priorities in terms of connecting with others, 
creating rather than consuming and getting physical activity, it's probably okay to be a little bit looser just now than you might typically be. And that, folks, is pretty much everything that I wanted to share with you in the time that we've got. If you'd like more information, can I direct you to a page that my wife has set up on Facebook called Bunker Down with Justin and Kylie. We pop in and out of there and provide people with everyday activities and inspiration to get through this challenging time. I mentioned also that my personal Facebook page, uh, Dr. Justin Coulson's Happy Families, we've got about 130,000 people who are following along there as well. And I'm the author of a bunch of books, which uh, mostly are only distributed in the Southern Hemisphere. We don't have distribution in the United States. So if you wanted to get hold of any of these, and I can assure you that they will be tremendous resources for you right now, especially relationship rules and 10 things every parent needs to know. Uh, they're just such useful books. You can get any of these six on Amazon as eBooks. So even though we don't have distribution of hard copies, you can get the eBooks on Amazon or wherever it is that you get your eBooks. And my website, happyfamilies.com.au has a shop where we can post them internationally if you like. It's just that you pay a little bit more. But you know what? With the Australian dollar being so bad, you're still going to get this stuff uh, very, very cheap anyway. So that's all from me. I would love for you to, like, like I said, follow along with my social pages. I'd love for you to grab any of these books that would be useful resources. Uh, I'm going to hand back over to the IFS team and they can take it from there. All right. Well, thank you so much, Justin. That was really just a lot of helpful information packed into a short amount of time. So we appreciate your going through the slides so quickly uh, as you did. Um, so I'm just going to start things off because there's there's one, one burning question I have had um, as the pandemic has gone on. Um, you know, I think a lot of families, uh, you know, we're, we're all very busy these days. Uh, you know, not these days, but you know, pre-pandemic. Um, and, you know, I think our lives sort of revolve around planning for the future. And that even extends to kind of the way that we um, discipline our children, the way we offer them incentives, the way we get them to finish what we want, you know, um, finish your homework so that you can go to the party tonight, you know, um, uh, finish practicing your instrument because we need to, you know, get going to do something else, um, you know, or kind of rewards that we're offering them. And similarly, I think on the other side, you know, a lot of us, uh, you know, especially with older kids, you know, or, you know, younger kids too, kind of use uh, you know, special things that are going to happen sometimes as uh, as ways of of disciplining our kids or of saying, you know, um, you know, if if you continue to behave this way, you're not going to be able to do X, Y, and Z. And I think what I've you know what I found with the pandemic is that you know our our worlds have shrunk significantly. Um, You've got no leverage, have you, Naomi? That's what you're saying. I have got no leverage, leverage left, <laughs> and um, and so I, maybe this means that I've been parenting wrong all the time. Um, but I also you know wonder whether a lot of people are thinking like well what you know what can I do to kind of um, you know make sure my my kids know I'm serious about this and and it's not just that I don't have the leverage it's also that you feel bad using it I mean you know the kids the kids lives you've already in some ways taken away so much from them so why would you want to um, but then the question is kind of how do you not let the the discipline situation get away from you such that you're always kind of feeling bad and saying, well, I, you know, I, I just don't want to punish you. I don't want anything to go wrong, more wrong in your life than it already is. Everything is so bad. So that's, that was my, my first question for you. What a great question. Uh, I, I think in some ways I answered it uh, through, through those slides that I shared, but let me just grab this here. So one of my favorite authors is a guy called Alfie Cohn. Uh, I love him and I hate him. He's so polarizing, but he's tremendously insightful and he's got a book that's called punished by rewards, which I just happened to have on my bookshelf behind me. And, and, and this was actually, the, this was, this was the book that uh, literally sent me back to university in the early two thousands. Uh, so that I could, I mean, I, I was already married with um, two kids uh, and we had a mortgage and I had a successful radio career. I was a radio DJ, but I was failing as a father. And one of the reasons that I was failing is because I was, using sticks and dangling carrots constantly with my kids. And we were constantly in these power struggles. There was so much control going on and fighting for control constantly. Uh, I read Alfie Cohn's Punished by Rewards and went back to school. Now, what I discovered from him, and by the way, he, he says in his book, we need to stop doing things to our kids and start working with them. We need to stop doing things to them and start working with them. But as I 
investigated more deeply once I began to get an academic background, what I discovered is that a lot of the work that he was relying on comes from a couple of researchers at the University of Rochester in upstate New York, uh, Ed DC and Rich Ryan. And these two extraordinary thinkers have created what is perhaps one of the most uh, well-researched theories in all of psychology. It's called self-determination theory. Essentially, the explore, explain, empower concept that I went through earlier is the answer, and it's based on this theory. So there's a tremendous, there's a truckload of evidence underpinning it. It's just that I don't tend to focus on the evidence. I tend to focus on, well, what can I help you to do in your family? So here's what I would do as my child's being really challenging. I would actually step in and name their emotion. You know, so I want to have soft eyes. I want to connect before I correct. I want to focus on the emotion, not the behavior. So I would say to my child, let me pick one of my kids at random. I'll pick Lily. Okay. She's my 10 year old. And I might say, Lily, you are having such a hard time this afternoon. You are just struggling so much. And your sister seems to be bothering you every time she breathes near you. You know, you know, when the kids are like, she's breathing my air, leave, don't leave me alone. And, and so I would say this, it, it's a really hard afternoon for you, isn't it? And now what Lily will normally do is she'll say, yes, I'm frustrated. And she'll tell me a bit about why she's frustrated. Now, the, the typical response is, well, you need to stop that or I'll, I'll, I'll fix you. you know, I'll take this off you. I'll do that. I'll, and that's, that's doing too. Whether it's timeout, withdrawal of privileges, uh, whether it's threatening to smack or whether it's yelling, uh, or sorry, you say spank in the United States, we, spanking, smacking, same, same. Uh, we use all of these power-based techniques to manipulate and coerce and force. Whereas it's so much more effective if we say, oh, you seem to be really struggling. Yeah. Hmm. Your little sister's driving you crazy, huh? Yeah. I just wanted to leave me alone. And, and then we, we say, Things like, uh, well, one, one of my favorite strategies is to give them in fantasy what they can't have in reality. So I might say, Lily, sometimes you just wish that you didn't even have a little sister at all, don't you? Now, that sounds really harsh. And yet, sometimes she actually does kind of wish that. And in the moment when she's really mad, she, she might. And, and when she says, yes, I'll, I might say, well, we could organize for the aliens to come and take her away, like we did your big brother. And she'll say, what big brother? I'll say, that's my point. <laughs> you, you never knew him. The aliens took him. Uh, and, and we can turn it into some fun. Now, now if we can't use humor because we're not that quick, we might just say, don't you just wish that things are different? Don't, don't you just wish you could be back at school? Don't you just wish? Don't you just wish? Great thing about don't you just wish is there's loads and loads of empathy. We're connecting with her emotional state. But we're also drawing a very clear line. You can't have it. So there's a very clear limit here, but don't you just wish that you could? Wouldn't it be amazing if you were able to? Some years ago, we were looking for a house. My wife and I had decided that we needed to find a new place to live. We'd been looking for over a year, couldn't find one. And then one day I found the house. It was the house that I was born to live in. I'm sure of it. Um, I don't know if you, you, you would have heard of Rupert Murdoch over in the United States. Well, Rupert's son, Lachlan, and his supermodel wife, Sarah, were selling their $13.5 million beachfront property in the eastern suburbs of Sydney which was about $13 million more than I had. But I called out to Kylie. I said, honey, you've got to look at this house. I found our dream home. I found the house that I want to own one day. And, and it was so funny. Kylie came in and she immediately saw the price tag. But she didn't say, oh, don't be so silly. Or why are you wasting my time? Oh, that's just ridiculous. You know, she didn't say anything like that. She said, oh my goodness, look at that home. They have a car elevator. Can you imagine driving your car into an elevator every night? Look at the view from the bathroom. Who has a view like that from the bathroom? She sat in the moment with me for, I'd say, five minutes, ogling this house. She gave me in fantasy what I can't have in reality. And as she left the room, she smiled and said, that sure is a nice house. What do you think we should do about it? And of course, you know, what, what was I going to say? Oh, let's call the bank. I, that, we, we were never going to be approved for something that was 13 times more than what we had money for. Um, when we do that with our children, what we do is we bring their emotions down. We're spending time exploring. We're focused on their heart, not their behavior. Because our kids are good kids and they want to do right and they'll do the best they can given the circumstances. But once we've done that, we've only done half the job because we've got to set clear limits. We're not just here to indulge their feelings. They need to know what's okay and what's not. But we don't need to threaten them. We don't need to bribe them. What we do instead is we say, okay, I get how you're feeling. Don't you just wish it was different? Ah, 
Well, you know what our rules are. And as much as I wish you could do that, we can't do that just yet. But what do you think we can do? What should we do? Where do we go from here? So explain is really, really tight. I'll only spend 10 seconds on that. And then we move to empower. What do you think is the best thing to do from here? Where do we go from here? And I believe that the answers are inside our children. In fact, my children and thousands of Australian families, children have proven that the answers are inside them. We've just got to give them the opportunity to be calm and feel understood, understand what the guidelines are, and then say, so what do you think? And Naomi, every now and again, the kids will say something that's outside of those boundaries. And you say, well, I guess that's one option, but remember the boundaries. <laughs> so. Now, there's one, other thing, well, there's one other thing that I want to quickly mention and then, and then I'll wrap up. But explain, explore, empower. That's the answer. That is the answer to your question. It's just that it's, it's a little slow, right? And people will be like, oh, this is going to take so long. I'm just going to say, go to your room. <laughs> because, but, but Stephen Covey, again, if I can quote him, uh, he said, fast is slow and slow is fast. You see, if you keep on relying on those quick fixes, you just have to keep on relying on the quick fixes. And it's exhausting, but when we go slowly and step them through this empathy, empathy filled boundary setting process, our children internalize. So if we go back to that self-determination theory idea, do you want to live your life as the police regulating everything that your children do? No. Who wants, who's got time for that? And by the way, the older they get, the harder those power struggles become. It's so much more effective if we can just work with them and come up with a solution that's mutually agreeable. My other favorite thing is just say, yes, of course you can tomorrow. You know, can I, I want to, I want to watch another movie. And I'm like, well, you've watched a couple of movies today, haven't you? Yes. How much screen time have you had? Lots, but I want to watch one more. Okay. That'll be fine. You can watch it tomorrow. And it's amazing. They're like, okay. <laughs> they're, they're happy with that. All right. Well, I have one more question, but uh, while I'm asking it, I wonder if people want to start uh, writing into the chat function and with their own questions. So um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I wrote a piece for the Institute for Family Studies about what I saw as kind of uh, emergency parenting, which seemed to be happening. Uh, a lot of people were just sort of, you know, they were themselves, obviously, you know, glued to the TV. They were giving their kids screens and snacks and anything to just sort of get through this. And they were writing notes to school saying, my kid cannot participate in school everything is an emergency and and we just can't do this and and it it sort of violated what you were talking about you know about trying to create some kind of routine for kids and and get them uh you know get them back to normal and i and i wonder you know when you're talking about um lowering expectations for school and and just trying to um you know understand what our priorities are you mentioned the the earthquake kids were out of school for like three months um you know we don't know how long this current situation is going to last and i guess the question is how do we decide as parents kind of what the new normal is and how do we we set that new normal and how do the behaviors that we institute now um, kind of affect how we're going to be living in you know in six months i like that uh that forward thinking uh emphasis what i would say is if you've had it all wrong up to now, or if you've been on holidays, oh, sorry, in America, I have to keep changing to American. If you've been on vacation, you know, in, oh, in the, the holiday group. thing, don't worry. <laughs> oh, right, right. So <laughs> if, you, if you've been on vacation and, and just lounging around watching Netflix for, for the last three weeks, that's okay. Uh, you know, we, we are where we are and it's been a time of tumult and upheaval and uh, insecurity and uh, unpredictability. But now that we recognize that we probably are in this for the long haul, uh, and probably the United States more so than uh, somewhere like Australia. Uh, what I would recommend is that you give your children some transition time, depending on their age. Older children need a little more transition time around this than younger children. But I would be saying, you know, the last few weeks have been fun. We've watched 43 different Netflix series. <laughs> we, we've gotten to know our neighborhood really well. Uh, but starting next week, we're going to be stepping back into a different kind of routine. We need to start to live life as close to normal as we're able to, given the circumstances. So let's have a conversation as a family around what that might look like. Depending on the age of your children, you want their voices. You want to literally counsel with them. So when it comes to schooling, what do you think is appropriate? What do you think would be a solution or a system that's going to work? The school is sending us work. When do you want to do it? How do you want to do it? How can we support you in that? Again, an autonomy supportive approach 
is going to be far more successful, far more effective. The research is there that shows it than a, an authoritarian dominating unilateral decision maker kind of approach. All right, kids, tomorrow we're back into it and I'm going to be driving it from, you know, from behind with the whip and that, that's not going to work for most families. Will we have some teething issues? Yes. Will there be some resistance? Absolutely. But remember the more force there is, the more resistance you get. Force creates resistance. Whereas when we take an autonomy supportive approach, well, there's, there's, there's three things that happen. We've got, we've got these basic psychological needs. Okay. One of them is for relatedness. We want to have great relationships. The next one is for competence. We want to feel like we're capable. And the third one is for a sense of volition in our lives. When we as parents dive in and say, it's going to be my way or the highway, you know, my house, my rules. What we do right then is we override that, that, that need for autonomy. In addition to that, we, we, we imply a lack of competence on the part of our children. Essentially, we're saying, you can't figure this out. I'm going to figure it out for you and make you do it my way. And in doing those two things, we really run roughshod over our relationships. We rupture our relationships. Whereas if we can work with our children rather than doing things to them, if we can sit down and say, let me understand what's going on for you. How can I help? You know, this is, let me explain what we're working towards. How do you feel about that? Okay, what can we do to support each other as we do that? We're simply going to have better outcomes, whether your child is four or 24, or even if it's your spouse or partner and they're 54, we're going to have better, better outcomes when we go through a, an explore, explain, empower process that acknowledges the importance of the relationship, the fact that they are capable of coming up with their own answers because they're competent humans, and we're giving them a sense of volition and control. That's how this all sort of fits together. Um, I don't I don't see any questions in the chat function, but I, I do see that uh, Brad Wilcox is with us. Uh, and so I'm going to see if he has any questions that he wants to, to ask and I'll let him introduce himself as well. Brad, you're on mute. We can't hear oh. you. There you go. Uh, thank, thank you, Justin, for a great, um, a great conversation with us tonight, I guess. I'm just wondering, you know, as the parent of a very large family, I've got some kids who are very motivated, you know, and very self-directed. And I think everything that you're saying about sort of how to kind of empower them, you know, explain things to them, explore things with them, seems to resonate as I think about some of my kids, right? But other kids, you know, that I have are, are really not that, that way at all. And, and, you know, they really do um, struggle more with you know, getting homework done, staying clear of screens and things like that. So I'm just wondering for kids who don't have as much of that kind of, you know, strong sense of volition, um, how do you adjust this approach that you're suggesting to us? You know, for kids who don't seem to really, you know, focus easily on homework and, you know, kind of focus on, on sort of getting some things done, what, what is, do you adjust this sort of this the three E's to I mean the temperaments of the kids that you're engaging? Yeah, because some some children are just really oppositional, right, Brad? They um, they look at you and they just say, "I don't want to." In fact, some of them even say no. <laughs> and as sure. a parent, you're like, right, of course. You, "You don't say no to me. I'm, I'm the parent. You've got to do the right thing." Um, again. At the risk of sounding like a broken record, uh, so so I, I, if I recall, you have eight children. Is that correct? Uh, no, we've got nine actually. Nine. My apologies. You've got nine. I've got six. So you 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 certainly experiencing the pressure cooker of family life. Um, what I've found, even when, I, and I and I certainly have a couple that are really difficult and lacking in motivation. There are two different ways that we can deal with this. Now there are some there are sometimes where something is simply expedient and it has to be done. In fact, there is a fourth step to those three E's, but it doesn't start with E. And so I tend to leave it out, except when I get questions like this. And the third, sorry, the fourth step is that we minimize controlling techniques. And I really want to emphasize the word minimize because there are some times where as a parent, we simply have to say, it's necessary that you do this. And I would really like to work with you on it. But if you're not willing to work with me, then I will have to become a lot more controlling than I want to be and that you want me to be. And so as a parent, sometimes we simply have to step in and say, all right, well, I'm going to you know, hashtag be the parent, scare quote, be the parent. I don't like that because some people kind of get on a bit of a power trip with that. But there are some times when we simply have to 
be the parent. And, and in fact, I, I, <laughs> I had that incident with my 11 year old, my 10 year old just yesterday, we were having our morning family meeting, we all come together. Uh, we have a faith background, we have a, a, a short devotional each morning. And then we sort of talk about what's coming up for the day, which as a you can imagine right now, there's not a whole lot coming up for the day, but we still have this, this morning meeting and she just didn't want to be there. But in our family, we've agreed uh, through various conversations over the years and months that uh, the, the family meeting is actually compulsory. It is necessary. We all need to be there for it. This is when we get together as a family and we want to have a sense of unity. It never feels unified though, when you've got to dr- kick a child kicking and screaming into the living room, that just doesn't, there's no unity there at all. But she's supposed to be there and she was being really moody and irritable. And so I stood in the corridor and I said, Lily, you seem really upset. What's the matter? I said, Neh. Like she, she was nonverbal. She's 10 years old, but just meh. I said, you're so upset that you're not actually going to use any appropriate language. You're just going to meh me, are you? And she said, meh. <laughs> and so I said to her, all right, well, you can meh if you want. But right now, our entire family except you is sitting in the living room waiting and we all have things to do. School's starting shortly. Uh, I need you to come into the living room. Now, would you like me to carry you or would you like to walk? Now I'm never going to punish her. I'm not going to yell and rant and rave and tear the house down to teach her a lesson, but I'm going to firmly let her know that if she can't do things that are reasonable in an appropriate way, then as her father, I have a responsibility to walk her into the living room so that we can have the meeting. And she chose to walk into the meeting. It took about a, uh, maybe a 90 second stare down, you know, staring at her before it happened. Uh, I don't like that strategy. I think that it damages relationships. It tramples all over autonomy, but sometimes whether we've got a, a, a stroppy four year old or six year old, or we've got a, just a temperamental teenager, sometimes we need to do that. But it usually works best if it comes from a foundation of trust and a foundation where the relationship has been established, where most of the time we are exploring, explaining and empowering, where we're saying, I want to understand why this is hard for you. Oh, by the way, two other things. Number one, don't ever try to do this when you've got an audience. If people are watching, your child will always act up. They'll resist. They'll, they, they won't deal with it well. And number two, you just can't do it when emotions are high. Now, I didn't have time to bring my little Lily, my 10-year-old, all the way back down here. I just needed to get instant compliance in that instance. Uh, but what I'll normally do is if I've got problems, I'll say, hey, you know what? This isn't working. Let's go for a walk. Let's walk around the block and talk about it. Or let's jump in the car and go down to the shops and we'll buy a snack and we'll have a conversation about it. In fact, I want these conversations to be so pleasant that I very often will make thick shakes for the kids and we'll sit down and we'll have a conversation about this hard thing over a, a thick shake or going for a walk with the dog or something like that because we want to be communicating positively. We want the, the conversation to be good. But with that tricky child, Brad, I, I would say... Um, you're really struggling with this and you hate it when I tell you what to do. You know, if you can name it, you can tame it. Why don't we go for a walk and we'll talk about it for a few minutes. No one's getting in trouble. I just want to understand why this is so hard for you. And then we spend more time exploring than we do explaining. In fact, like I said, the explain part's pretty short. And then we say, all right, well, you know what the expectation is, but I know how you're feeling. So how are we going to fix this? What do we do? And then be quiet and just let them, work it out is that helpful yeah no it's helpful we have some questions now on the chat as well justin can you see those yes i can actually uh dexter has said a uh, great presentation i'm a counseling psychologist from trinidad trinidad and tobago it's unfortunate the education ministry in trinidad has done the opposite and flooded the children with schoolwork as a trauma specialist i believe that not enough emphasis is being placed on the psychological fallouts of this virus I, I would agree and in fact john has said that as well i'd agree with you dexter no thought went into the situation how to deal with it dexter says additionally the entire country is under quarantine and school is out until september the issues are much greater than I think that should be a then parent child issues and leads to youth crime and delinquency. So there's, there's a whole lot of um, speculation. Uh, there's some really intelligent people who are highlighting the social costs of these regulations across the world in different places. Uh, and I would agree. I, I don't know that there's much that I can add other than it's, it's frustrating to hear that. And I would be saying to my children, one to two hours is fine. Unless you're in your senior years of school, you know, I'm talking uh, grades, nine, 10, 11, and 12, uh, and maybe even grade nine. Don't worry so much. Just ease up a little bit. Um, I don't know if there's anything that you want to add to that, Brad, or if I should just go on to the next one. 
You can go on to the next one. Okay. So Denise has said, Ginnott said, communication with children should be based on respect and on skill. It requires A, that the messages preserve the child's as well as the parent's self-respect and B, that statement, there it is, beautiful, that statements of understanding precede statements of advice or instruction. So I, I talk about that, that B statement. That's what I was trying to remember before, Denise, that I couldn't find. So thank you so much for finding that quote. Statements of understanding should always precede statements of advice or instruction. My, my way of saying that, uh, because that's kind of wordy, is that we need to connect before we correct. Which sounds really easy when you read it on the screen or hear me say that. But I'll tell you what, when you're in that situation where uh, you've just sliced the peanut butter toast for your four-year-old into triangles and they have a meltdown and say, but I wanted rectangles. You don't sort of think, oh, this is an opportunity for me to connect before I correct. You're like, oh, for goodness sake. And you've, it's a rookie error, by the way. Anyone who's got a four-year-old should know that you always chop into rectangles first because if they want triangles, it's just one easy diagonal and you've got the rectangle. But if you chop into rectangles, uh, so triangles first, you, you, you just can't make a rectangle out of a triangle. It's, it's terrible. Naomi, I'm so glad you're laughing. Thank I'm, you. I, this, this is the parenting advice people have tuned in for, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, and Bethany said, oh, no, toast should never be cut, according to my four-year-old. Oh, well, yeah, but there we go. See, Bethany's four-year-old says don't cut the toast at all. Uh, and, and just quickly, and, and I, I do have a, a call that I need to be on in five minutes, so I might need to wrap up around here. But uh, Denise also added one of the teachers in our district told parents that this is not homeschooling but crisis schooling and parents should feel comfortable lightening up you know I've seen a whole range of uh, emails and social media posts from school principals and teachers who are saying the same kind of thing you're not a teacher you're the parent your job is just to make sure that they're doing some reading and that they're doing stuff that they're interested in and we'll send some stuff home and if you do it that's great and if you don't there's no expectation I had a mum just the other day who said she's She's got a grade five daughter and they're working from 8.30 until 4.30 and still not getting through all of the schoolwork. I said, what are you doing? Like, j just let it go. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the last one, just quickly, John sure. said, oh, sorry, I, I'm, I'm at home since March 15 with two kids, five and six, and I chose to focus on living together rather than routine schoolwork and chores. Of course, I seize the learning opportunities when they arise. And they do. You know, there's that just that opportunistic learning, that incidental learning that happens because we're living. And I think that's a great approach. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Colson, for this. We really appreciate it. And uh, there will be a round of applause if you could hear everyone, but they're muted. So thanks again for being with us today. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for the thumbs up, Brad. And, and good luck, everyone. Good night. And uh, like I said, if you'd like any more, I do a whole bunch of stuff for free. IFS is fabulous. Uh, I love the work that you do. And I'd love for people to find me on social media and, and join in as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, Thank so much, you. Justin.